Good afternoon, ladies, and gentlemen, boys, and girls. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Big Akar Ahmed, and welcome to today's video. Today, we're going to go ahead and get into the Catholic Church. Where did the Catholic Church come from? Why is it considered so demonic or so evil? And what are the different things or conspiracies or historical events that led up to this understanding that this is an evil? type of group rather than something that's trying to push through the word of Jesus Christ, peace and blessings be upon him and enlighten him through the highest ability. Now we're going to go ahead and check out a video that is an animated video. It's going to go ahead and explain these different things, historical events or conspiracies, whatever you want to call them around the Vatican in the Catholic church. But first I just kind of want to go through a little history lesson on what it is. Okay. The Catholic Church was started by the Nicene Creed, and this was roughly three to four hundred years after Jesus Christ had gone ahead and left us. So this is way, way well after Jesus had been crucified and gone, okay? And I'm Muslim, so I have a different belief system. I have a different belief when it comes to Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon him. But that is irrelevant right now and right here. I just wanted to make that clear. Jesus went ahead and passed away somewhere around 30 years old, correct? And the Roman Empire were the ones who conspired against Jesus with the Jewish people at the time. Now, the Roman Empire is also the empire that created the Catholic Church. They created Catholicism through the Nicene Creed. What did these creeds do? What did this creed do specifically three to four hundred years after Jesus? What they did was they compiled the Gospels and they compiled these Gospels in Koinaic Greek. They placed these Gospels together, seeing fit how they wanted to, leaving out what Gospels they wanted to leave out and adding what Gospels they wanted to go ahead and put in. Once they had gone ahead and chose their self, and they were inspired by God somehow. The same people who killed Jesus are now inspired by God to put together Jesus' word. They gone ahead and put together the canonized Bible that we all have today. The most popular being the King James Version that has been, you know, passed down. But we have many different versions of the Bible. And we have versions of the Bible from different sects other than Catholicism that have gone ahead and added specific gospels that were left out from this Nicene Creed from the Catholic Church that have gone ahead and re-added these gospels back in or have taken extra gospels out that they believe do not see or they don't deem fit within the story of Jesus Christ. Now, my understanding um, from a Muslim perspective is who gave you the right to take out or add what God's story is? Who gave you the right to be the judge on what people are going to follow. And then on top of going ahead and canonizing this Bible and choosing what Gospels you want to put in and the order you want to put them in, how people perceive them, you give the interpretation. You gave the understanding. You've created a whole curriculum around how to understand the Bible from the Catholic perspective. And you have this whole entire government system that is laid over on top of it. The last time I checked, every single prophet of God had came to give us a non-governmental system, meaning God is the Almighty, the one who goes ahead and chooses the rules, the morality, the everything. Not the Pope, or not the Pope's the next Pope, or not the President, or not the, the, the Prime Minister. The number one in the head of every state, every country, Every creation is God Almighty, the creator of all things. And he's the one that has sent prophets here and has sent his message down to earth through the best examples that we possibly could ever have gotten. All of the prophets, peace and blessings be upon them, to go ahead and learn these things. Now, why do we need the Catholic Church to go ahead and enforce it on us? Like they are the Jesus police. This is something that I find very, very interesting, and this is something that many other people find interesting, especially knowing that the Catholic Church was founded by the Romans. It founded in Rome. It was put together in Rome by the same exact people who crucified Jesus, who wanted Jesus dead and gone, and it was also, you know, in works with the Jewish people of the time who refused Jesus as their Messiah. Peace and blessings be upon him who will return for his second coming. Now, this is where it gets very, very, very interesting, right? Is who gave 
these individuals the power and the authority to go ahead and run the Christian world and the word of God, the word of Jesus, right? And dictate it and change it and update it and appoint who they want to appoint to teach it all across the world from bishops to uh, cardinals to priests all across the world and nuns and create these rituals and create these rules and create these things that aren't even found in the Bible and apply them on a lot of humanity. We're talking 1.3 billion human beings. This is the second largest sect or following of religion on the planet next to Sunni Islam. Go Sunni Islam, I believe, is 1.5 billion humans. And Catholicism has around 1.3 billion followers within the religion of Christianity. So what attracts so many people? How did it get such a big foundational point? And how did it grow so fast? As the Roman Empire died, it really seems like they found a different way to really grab people using this Christianity. And during the time of Christ, during the time of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, there was no Christianity. He came as a Jewish man through lineage, Jesus, who came as the Messiah for the Jewish people to lead them back to the laws of God. That is literally what happened. So it's very interesting that Jesus didn't come and create a whole new religion and name it Christianity and name it after himself who's Christ, right? That never happened. So I find it very interesting is where did this all start? How did this all happen? And who's responsible? And the per the answer is the Catholic Church is responsible, the creed of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed. And we'll go ahead and get into some different reasons on why they are a bad apple. Pope Sylvester the Demonic Sorcerer Pope Sylvester II was supposedly a sorcerer who was waited on by his own personal demons, who also allegedly helped him become the Pope in the first place. But was Pope Sylvester really a sorcerer? Or was he just another ordinary Pope who became the victim of medieval rumors? Pope Sylvester was born in France in 946 AD. He was sent to a Benedictine monastery as a small child and grew to be an excellent student. Then, in his adult years, he studied extensively in Spain. Back then, Spain was a sort of neutral ground between the Franks ruling in Europe and the Islamic Moors who'd only recently lost their position of power in the country. Because of his closeness to both cultures, Pope Sylvester grew up with a lot of different ideas ideas many members of the church didn't share. Pope Sylvester ultimately became the tutor for the son of Holy Roman Emperor Otto I, which gained him political connections, who, in 999 AD, chose him to become the next pope. Unfortunately for Sylvester, the Italians revolted against imperial rule just two years later. Emperor Otto III died at the young age of 21, and Sylvester II followed soon after. It wasn't until Sylvester was dead that the rumors began to spread. Cardinal Bino accused Sylvester of being the first in a line of popes who were magical sorcerers. He said that Sylvester had a close relationship with a demon who helped him get into power, but the demon then tricked him and killed him. People were still talking about Sylvester and how he learned to call spirits up from hell 200 years later. And now for number 9. But first, it's shout out time again. I wanted to give a big thank you to Johnny Sutherland for the super thanks. We appreciate you supporting this channel. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to the channel and join the family. Number 9. The Pope and the Pine Cone Why is there a giant pine cone statue inside Vatican City? It's because the Vatican has a deep history with the occult and blasphemous spiritualization that goes back centuries. The pine cone statue is called the Pignone. It's seen by thousands of visitors every day in the Cortile della Pigna courtyard within the larger complex of the Vatican Museum. The statue is a piece of Roman artwork from 1800 years ago. It's a whopping 12 feet, 3.6 meters tall, and was originally constructed near the baths of Agrippa. Archaeologists suspect the giant pine cone once decorated the Temple of Isis, where in the early days of Christianity, Romans still gave praise to the Egyptian gods. It so he just said in the early days of Christianity, they gave the Romans still gave praise to the Egyptian gods. 
And I, what I also find interesting is the story of Jesus, how he died and resurrected on the third day, and his resurrection and his death are represented by a cross, and that same cross is the Egyptian ink that they used in the Egyptian pagan times to as a resurrection tool. The ink is a tool of resurrection, which is also a cross. So I find it very interesting that the Roman Empire, who are pagans, who believe in pagan gods and do pagan rituals and believe in the Egyptian pagan gods like Isis, who used to use the ink, the cross, to resurrect people, resurrect their kings and their other gods especially, right? In Christianity, the cross that everyone wears around their neck or has, you know, as 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 a as a uh, representation of Christianity, that same cross represents the death and the resurrection of your God or your King or Messiah or, you know, beloved one, for instance. And there is such, such, such a similar correspondence here in the understanding of this and it was created by the same people so the cross and the understanding of all of this all came from the roman empire nowhere in the bible when you read the bible when you read the gospels new testament the old testament do you get this understanding of let me wear a cross the cross represents resurrection and and all of these things but you believe that jesus was resurrected on the third day and died on a cross just as the Egyptians believe that they can resurrect people using the ink, which is a cross. And this is a historically known pagan thing that they used to practice, especially in Rome. It was in 1608 AD that the massive pine cone statue was placed in the courtyard. Most scholars agree the pine cone is a representation of the pineal gland, an important part of the human brain. The pineal gland is often associated with the third eye and human enlightenment. It doesn't seem like anything that belongs in front of the Vatican, and yet there it is, a larger-than-life pine cone in the holiest place in Europe. The symbol likely originated long ago in the pagan world with the worship of the demonic Israel deity named Baal, and was later used by worshippers of Sibylle. But to this day, nobody can say with complete certainty why it's such an important symbol at the Vatican. Number 8. The Black Madonna it's funny how they keep all of these Roman pagan statues that represent nothing but evil, nothing but idolatry, nothing but the the forg forgetting of God Almighty and the submission to God Almighty and submitting yourself to a statue or submitting yourself to these different entities or these different powers. It's funny how they protect them so much when they're supposed to be so against them supposed to be against paganism they're supposed to be against these idolatry uh symbols or you know symbols in general like jesus christ peace and blessings be upon him to the christians out here listening he didn't come to teach you to preserve statues and to praise statues and to go ahead and protect a culture that worked to kill his message that worked to kill him that worked to praise everything but the creator of the heavens and the earth and pray to statues, pray to Egyptian gods, pray to Greek gods. This is something that is pure blasphemy and everyone will be questioned for these things on the day of judgment when you stand in front of your creator. And it's so sad to see like all of the pagan statues, everything that marked the paganism of Rome still there today in the old city of Rome where the Vatican stands, where the Catholic capital of the whole world stands, it's just filled with paganism, and it's so sad to see. Madonna. There are over 500 black Madonnas spread throughout the world. These small black statues can be found in chapels and cathedrals all the way from the mountains in Switzerland to the grand churches of Mexico. They're carved from wood or painted on stone, and most of them appeared under mysterious circumstances between the 11th and 15th centuries AD. Millions of people visit the Black Madonna every single year. But what exactly is it that she represents to the world? Some call the Black Madonna the counterpart to the Virgin Mary. Some have named her the Queen of the Earth, and others even believe she represents an ancient fertility goddess and has nothing to do with God or Jesus Christ. Many scholars have theorized that the Black Madonna has its origins in ancient pagan shrines, 
where people once worshipped goddesses such as Diana, Artemis, or Isis. Some of the statues even look like the Egyptian goddess Isis cradling her infant son Horus. The Black Madonna may even be a representation of an elder power, a nameless feminine force. There's a painting of the Black Madonna in Poland from the 14th century AD painted by St. Luke on a Cyprus tabletop. There are multiple statues of the Black Madonna in France, including one hidden in a crypt in Chartres called Our Lady of the Underground. But that's only two examples out of over 500. Number 7. Ancient Corruption The Vatican has been called the seat of an ancient Roman cult whose leaders... The problem with the Black Madonna and things of this nature is where do these things come from? This is not something taught by Jesus. This is not something taught by the prophets beforehand. This is not something sent down by God. So why practice it? Why implement these things into the Catholic Church, into a religion where you find it all over the world? You're implementing these statues of new people or you're claiming that, you know, there's virgins or saints where Jesus came incarnated as this guy and he's a saint. Or, you know, Virgin Mary came incarnated as one of these virgin women in the 1900s. And that's Virgin Mary incarnated. And you pray to things that aren't God. Like, praying to Jesus is one thing because you believe Jesus is God. He's a part of a trinity. But then praying to Mother Mary, praying to these saints, praying to these virgins, invoking them, asking them to go ahead and pray for you is crazy to me. This is so blasphemous. This is so directly against monotheism and prayer to God. It's such a slap in God's face. It makes no sense at all. If you're connected to the Creator, if you're connected to the Lord, if Jesus taught you to pray directly to God, when Jesus prayed, He prayed to the Father, the Father alone. That was it. He didn't pray to Himself. He didn't tell you to invoke through me. He said to pray to the Father alone. Every single prophet through history prayed to the Father alone. The Jewish people prayed to the Father alone. The Muslims prayed to the Father alone. So why in Catholicism do you pray to everything else but the Father? Why are we praying to Jesus? Why are we praying to Mary? Why are we praying to virgins and saints and statues? This doesn't even make sense. This is so pagan rooted and you need to be very careful when you're going ahead and following a religion. When you're going ahead and trying to figure out the word of God or follow the word of God, you need to make sure it's coming from God and it's not coming from a man. There's a bloodthirsty Satanists who've been involved in everything from child sacrifice to burning people alive. The pontiffs of the church have also been accused of demonic worship and of only forcing their lowest level priests into celibacy, which the Bible says nothing about. This has been going on since the first century BC. Here's a little... That's also another thing is they forced the priest into, into celibacy. They forced the nuns into it. They're, you're not allowed to get married. You're not allowed to have children if you're a nun or if you're a priest. Isn't that who should be reproducing are the ones who actually have given their life to God Almighty? Aren't those the ones who should be having children, not the people who are drinking and divorced and just having sex on the weekends? Why are the people who are dedicated dedicated to God Almighty and have the influence and have the education and have the knowledge, why aren't they reproducing? We want their kids. We want more of their kids. And it's kind of crazy to me to see that this is a rule. It's like, no, you're married to the church. You can't, you know, you can't get married and you can't touch a woman or you can't touch a man. You're just completely, you know, separated and segregated. When, you know, our highest, highest forms of you know, examples in Christianity are Mother Mary and Jesus, right? And his disciples. Like, Mother Mary got married. She had kids. Yeah, she might have had a virgin child. But she got married and, 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 and lived her life after. It's not like she was just, like, a virgin her whole entire life. This is something that God blesses us with as human beings. He blessed us with reproductive parts. And may God bless and take care of every single person. Inshallah, they find the right, you know, wife or the right husband who is, you know, good-hearted, who has a good faith. And that 
you guys can lead each other closer and closer and closer to your creator and closer and closer and closer to salvation. This is so beautiful and have children and reproduce and these children to become closer to God, to become more knowledgeable, to become greater than you. This is something that God has blessed us with. This is something that we we see missing within our second half of our life. Without this, we feel dead inside. So it's crazy to me too. I just want to go ahead and touch on that, that, that these priests... And these nuns, they can't get married. They can't have kids. And I don't know who made this up, but it's not in the Bible. Jesus never tells you to do this. Uh, Mother Mary never tells you to do this. God Almighty never ordains to not have children. This is something that is found nowhere else but the Catholic Church. Lesson in etymology, the study of a word's origin and evolution. The word pontiff comes from the ancient pre-Republican title of Pontifex Maximus. This was an ancient position controlled by a handful of ruthlessly powerful Roman families. In the days of the Roman Republic, the Pontifex Maximus was the high priest of the cult of Magna Mater, also known as Sibylle. These were, according to the legends, cultists who enjoyed sacrificing people to their demonic gods. Religion has always played a major role in Rome. When the Republic shifted to an empire, religious leaders still held great sway in the political landscape. These were pagan high priests who acted as community leaders throughout the Roman Empire. And yes, they allegedly dabbled in human sacrifice and even cannibalism. When Christianity became popular, the pontiffs who'd been ruling over the cult institutions began to rule over what would become the Roman Catholic Church. If we follow this thread to the end, the implication is astounding. The popes and those powerful families who through nepotism elected their own kin as pontiffs simply transitioned from pagan occultism to Christianity. Although some scholars believe demonic worship and secret child sacrifices lasted all the way until at least 1057 AD. Number 6. Vatican Black Magic I believe that it's still happening today. Maybe not directly within the Vatican, but it's happening. And it's not just happening within the Vatican. It's happening all over the world by all these occultists. And it's sickening. These powerful sickos. There's a theory that says there's an archive of secret knowledge and lost ancient wisdom hidden beneath the Vatican. It all has to do with the Great Library of Alexandria. It was said that the library, which was originally dedicated to the nine goddesses of arts and sciences, contained magical wisdom that had been passed down for untold centuries. It's true that the library was partially burned by Julius Caesar in 48 BC, but that wasn't the end of the story. It's likely that only a small part of the collection was damaged and the rest was transported to Rome. That secret knowledge that was saved from the library was later taken and kept safe inside the Vatican secret archives. At least, a portion of the knowledge was kept at the Vatican. It's believed the rest of the sacred scripts and secret texts were divided between Mount Athos in Greece and St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt. Nobody knows for sure what kinds of magical tomes might be hiding underneath the Vatican. One rumored book is something called the Red Dragon or the Gospel of Satan. This is said to be the most powerful black magic grimoire in existence. It was originally found in Solomon's tomb in Jerusalem, then later it made its way to the Vatican. Rumor I was just about to say, um, has it the grimoire was written by the devil himself and contains instruction. I was just about to say that the strongest magic is underneath Solomon's tomb in Jerusalem. And this is why they're going to need the Antichrist to go ahead and grab this stuff. The Antichrist wants the black magic books. He wants these things because this is what makes him powerful. This is what makes him uh, have the influence ahead of you in things of this nature. He's not just going to come like divinely chosen as the Antichrist with magic powers. He's going to come and he's going to acquire these things. And it's funny because I was going to pause the video before they said anything about Solomon's temple because they said it was this is one of the uh, most, you know, black magic evil books that have ever been created. They even say that it was written by Satan himself. I was going to pause it and say this has this has to be like something from Solomon's, you know, tomb because this is where the strongest of black magic was kept and it was sealed was the seal of Solomon, was Solomon's tomb and um, in, in the second temple where the third temple will be built. And this is so, so, so crazy 
to today's standards of things. Because right now when you see what Israel is doing with the Palestinian people and what they're trying to acquire and accomplish while they're calling for the return of their Messiah or their Messiah and they don't believe it's Jesus, we believe that the Jewish Messiah is the Antichrist. Because they're waiting for someone to come to establish a third temple, a temple mount, on where the Seal of Solomon is, where the Black Magic Books of Solomon are hiding. And they don't believe it's Jesus. So if the Christians and the Muslims believe there's an Antichrist before the Messiah comes, then the Antichrist is going to be the Jewish Messiah. That's the one that they're going to take as their leader because they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe to take Jesus as their Messiah. They've already denied him once and they'll deny him again. No problem according to their own theology. So I find this very, very, very interesting as well. ...for making demonic pacts with dark forces. Do you actually think grimoires were used to summon demons? Let us know in the comments down below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Number 5. The Devil Pope Pope Alexander VI was the worst pope in history. Historians generally agree that Alexander was by far the most despicable ruler of the Vatican in all of its history. He became the head of the Catholic Church on August 11th, 1492 AD. He would only serve as the ruler of the Papal States until his death 11 years later in 1503 AD, and he only came into his position because he was born into the extremely prominent Borgia family, a bloodline who had ties to Rome going back countless centuries. As a member of the Borgia family, Pope Alexander used his power and position to put his own family in as advantageous a position as possible. In other words, he abused his position as Pope to better maneuver his own family financially and politically. He also did a bunch of other terrible things, like fathering multiple children with his mistresses. But perhaps the one act that had the most impact was done in 1493 AD. This was shortly after Christopher Columbus landed in North America. Pope Alexander issued paper. Christopher Columbus was one of the biggest pushes of Catholicism in North and South America that has ever, ever, ever happened on the planet. You want to talk about colonization? You want to talk about the spread of religion by the sword, by the lies, by, by everything? Go ahead and figure out how the North America and South Americas were colonized and pushed and forced into this Catholic belief system, into the Catholic Church. It is insane how many people paid the price, how many societies paid the price for the spread and the control that the Catholic Church now has over North and South America that they took in the 1400s. Bulls, which gave the right to the Spanish crown in the newly discovered land in the Americas. Pope Alexander essentially said that Spain had permission from God to not only take all the land they found in the new world for themselves, but also to enslave its people. Mm, sounds kind of like Israel, right? God gave us permission to just take this land and kick all of you out or enslave you, right? Makes sense. Number four, Elizabeth Barton. Elizabeth Barton also... We'll go ahead and stop it right here. If you guys want to check out the rest of the video, I'm going to go ahead and link it right down below. But I just want to go ahead and check out a bunch of different points on, you know, what may make the Catholic Church a iffy, you know, an iffy subject to be talking about. Um, what gives them more of the, you know, demonic or evil type of things. This guy kind of went more historical and gave historical points of different popes and different things of this nature, different statues that may be sitting outside the Vatican that represent pagan things of this sort. Why would pagan statues or, you know, pagan leaders or, you know, people who are money hungry that had did horrible things or did made ch child sacrificing or colonized complete lands, why would these be the representations of God's word or the truth holders of the world? Are these really, really, really the truth holders? Does God operate in this way? Did God give them the permission to go slaughter all these people and do all of these different things? We don't believe so. Now, this is why the devil um, has an influence over so many different people and so many different things. No one is infallible. No one is just fully, fully protected from their free will or you know their immunity um, or immune of the devil's tactics. 
But when you create a personal relationship with God Almighty, when you become personally close to your creator, nothing can no longer touch you. Separate yourself from the statue. Separate yourself from, you know, praying through someone and pray directly to your creator. He is strong enough to hear you. He's strong enough to answer. And when you ask, you will receive. Thank you guys so much for coming in today. God bless every single one of you. And if you have any comments or concerns, go ahead and leave them down below. Can't wait to hear from you. And until next time, free Palestine, baby.